Hello everyone and welcome to the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. This is episode 10 for July 18th, 2016. So basically the 8th year anniversary of The Dark Knight. It has nothing to do with anything, but I just felt like saying something. So yeah, we've got a couple news stories here. Um, some of them were happening uh, before I recorded episode 9, which is you know, if you follow me, came up on Wednesday because I had several early morning shifts over at work. So I just didn't have the time to record it for Sunday or Monday. But I'm back. It's coming up on a Monday. So I hope if you're listening to this on a Monday, then good for you. Then I'm right. But anyway, let's move on to the first bit of news, which is sad for a couple reasons. One, because it's just um, another 2016 death, but it's also sad in the sense that nobody else, when it comes to doing movie news shows, or just movie news in general, will catch up on. And that is that Yumi Ito, who was one of the original Mothra twins, has passed away um and actually, in May, uh, this story comes from Sci-Fi and was posted on the 11th of July. And it says here, Yesterday, various Japanese outlets reported the sad news that Yumi Ito, sister of the late Emi Ito, uh, who died on June 15th, 2012, passed away. Uh, although Yumi had died May 18th of this year, press is only just now getting word of it. Uh, I actually don't know how that works, how you get a uh, word on someone's death two months later but i mean unless they're a missing person i don't don't know i'm not going to get into that detail yumi and her identical twin sister were best known in japan as the vocal duet the peanuts Uh, yumi the eldest of the two and imi uh, debuted with the charge dropping single uh, kawaii hana in 1959 Uh, godzilla fans know the peanuts as the shobinji uh, or little beauties from infant island mothra's tiny priestess Yumi and Amy were miniaturized by special effects director Eiji Tsuburaya's trick photography in Mothra 1961, which I reviewed earlier this year, so you can go check that out on my channel. After Mothra's debut in the United States, the Peanuts were given the stage on the Ed Sullivan Show where they performed Lover Come Back to Me for American audiences, which there's actually a video on YouTube, which I'm not going to play because, um, well, A, I'm looking at all the news through my iPad, so my computer doesn't slow down, uh, and the audio might not come out very well. And two, I don't want to get any sort of um, like copyright claim for it. I mean, I'm sure I would be fine if I played it, but right now I'm just still kind of in the realm with these podcasts that I don't want to do anything to like get a claim on them. So you can go check that out on YouTube. It's called The Peanuts Dash Lover Come Back to Me. Successful in both pop music and film, Yumi and Emmy reprised their roles as the little beauties in Mothra vs. Godzilla and Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, both of which were released in 1964 in Japan. Director Shohanda gave them high praise for their professionalism and talent, despite not being traditional actresses. Ghidorah, however, would be their last appearance as the Little Beauties. Yumi and Emi were replaced by Yuko and Yoko Okada of the pair Bambi for Ebira Horror of the Deep. Yumi retired in 1975 after Emi married pop singer Kenji Sawada. Yumi turned her attention towards fashion while making periodic returns on stage alongside her sister over the years. With the Peanuts gone, so is another piece of the Godzilla franchise's soul. Mothra's little beauties have come home. Yumi Ito was 75. So, I mean, this is just a little sad because, as you all know, unless you don't follow me, I'm a massive Godzilla fan. Like, Next to Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Godzilla is, like, the key franchise for me. I absolutely love it. I adore it. Uh, and the Mothra Twins, yeah, they were a key part of the Godzilla series, even though they originated with Mothra. And it's just kind of sad to know that both of them are dead, but at the very least, they're back together again up in the skies, huh? And Mothra, as I've said in my review, is my favorite, my absolute favorite um, Toho monster movie that doesn't feature Godzilla in it. It's like almost on par with the original Godzilla for me. So this is just a little sad news um, because, I mean, when you watch the Mothra movies or any of the the three movies with them in it, Mothra vs. Godzilla, Mothra or Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, 
they're they are really incredibly talented and they have incredible singing voices especially during the sacred spring song in mothra versus godzilla like it takes place soon after godzilla has emerged and starts destroying tokyo so it's it's a sad time but um at least they're together again so let's move on Let's move back into the news that most people have already covered. Let's stay in the realm of monsters, but instead of Toho monsters, let's talk Universal monsters. Huh? Uh, we have some set images of the upcoming Mummy reboot starring Tom Cruise, but these set photos show off Sofia Botella as the monster. Don't know who she is? Well, she was the henchman in Kingsman who had those really awesome prosthetic death legs so basically there are set photos that popped up showing her in makeup and costume as the monster and it's a little strange i mean i think it's going to be pretty clear that she's not going to be the original mummy emotep who was in the original mummy from 1932 but was also the main antagonist in the two stephen summers mummy movies the mummy and the mummy returns so i mean the set photos, I'm looking at them now, they look pretty cool, but the question is, will it be scary? And that's kind of the thing that I'm asking about this whole uh, Universal Monsters universe. Like, overall, will it be scary? Because the original Universal Monster movies back in the day had, like, some sort of creepiness to them at points. At least the essential movies, like Dracula, Frankenstein, The Wolfman... Uh, the original Mummy, The Invisible Man, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and so on. But um, I'm just worried that with Tom Cruise as the lead role in this movie, are they going to do um, like sort of the action thing again? Like with the Brendan Fraser Mummy movies? I mean, well, here's the official synopsis for The Mummy. And this article comes from Screen Crush. It says, Tom Cruise headlines a spectacular all-new cinematic version of the legend that has fascinated cultures all over the world since the dawn of civilization, the mummy. Thought safely entombed in a crypt deep beneath the unforgiving desert, an ancient queen, played by Sophia Botella of Kingsman the Secret Service and Star Trek Beyond, whose destiny was unjustly taken from her, is awakened in our current day, bringing with her maleficence grown over millennia and terrors that defy human comprehension so that's pretty much what it says and we also have another bit of news about universal monsters moving over from the mummy to frankenstein javier bardem is being eyed for the role of frankenstein in monster in the universal in the universal monster movie universe and this report comes from Variety. Having already filled up its upcoming monster universe with A-list talent, including Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, and Russell Crowe, Universal is now eyeing another star to revive a famous character. Sources tell Variety that Javier Bardem is in talks to star as Frankenstein in Universal's classic monster movie series. It's currently unknown which monster feature Bardem would first appear in. Cruz and Crow's The Mummy, the first film in the monster series, is nearly done with filming. Universal is also developing a Bride of Frankenstein feature, but sources indicate that Bardem's Frankenstein would likely appear in another monster pick first, with the possibility of getting a spin-off down the road. So, here's something that's kind of confusing. In our pop culture today, I mean, maybe people have stopped with this, but... People have had a habit of mistakenly calling the monster Frankenstein, when in actuality Frankenstein is the scientist, not the monster. So the big question here is, is he going to be playing the monster? Because, I mean, he does, no offense to Javier Bardem, but he does look like he has Frankenstein monster traits to his face. Or could he be playing Dr. Frankenstein? Kind of, hmm... It's hard to say because, again, not much information is given out, and when it just says um, I'd for Frankenstein role, it's a little hard to kind of determine whether or not you're playing the monster or the doctor. So we'll see what happens further along down the road. With this Universal Monster Movie universe, I'm looking forward to it. But one thing that I would like for it to do is actually be scary. Not horror movies per se but like have horror elements to them uh, make us feel scared by these monsters uh, and i think with all these um 
casting choices like Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, Russell Crowe, The Rock in consideration for The Wolfman, and Javier Bardem, I think it might be safe to say that um, we're ignoring Dracula Untold, the universal monster movie that came out in 2014. Yeah, it was 2014. I remember that thing being atrocious. It was like abs- it was basically uh, underworld bad. But with a bunch of talented A-list actors in this new series, I'm really excited for this. So we'll see what happens. So you know what? We're gonna take a break, and when we come back, more movie news on the way involving Starship and. Inter- so so with that said, we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, more movie news on the way. So stay tuned. Love what I'm doing on this channel? Love watching movie reviews, let's plays, or podcasts? Want to help the channel grow even further? Then you can go over to patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson and give out a monthly donation, and you'll help the channel grow. In return, you'll get special rewards such as access to retro reviews, let's plays, and podcasts before anyone else does. And if you don't want to donate or can't donate, then hey, that's perfectly awesome. You get awesome content regardless. But the really cool thing is you can donate maybe as little as a penny. You can donate a penny a month if you want. So, I mean, any little bit will do, and your support is greatly appreciated. So again, that's patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Go over there and donate. Help this channel grow. Again, patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Okay, and we're back. Thank you for sticking around. Now let's get into some more movie news, something that I feel like we saw coming. So we all know Pokemon Go has come out. It's been out for a couple weeks right now. And funny enough, I started playing my Pokemon Fire Red Let's Play a few weeks before the release date of Pokemon Go. So, ha, beat you to it. But anyway... um. We saw this was coming anyway. Uh, this story comes from Screen Rant that Legendary is trying to get the rights to make a live action Pokemon movie. Which, ooh, I don't know. Which, in like a right sense, if you're making a live action Pokemon movie, it does kind of make a little sense for Legendary to go after this because they're partnered with Universal. And they're going to have a Nintendo Land down the road at many of their theme parks. So I think Nintendo, if they were to agree to this, they would still, they would want to do it with a company that already has a deal with them. But um, I don't know about a live action Pokemon movie. And to make matters even worse, at least personally for me, the potential screenwriter for this could be Max Landis, which I do not like Max Landis at all. Like, as a human being, I can't say because I've never met the guy. I'm sure he's cool. But in terms of, like, his talent as a writer, I think in terms of movies alone, he is just so egotistical and really he's just he just talks a lot. He talks a lot and does not do a thing. But anyway, enough Max Landis ranting. Let's get to this story here. According to Deadline, the seemingly always busy Max Landis, writer of Chronicle and a draft of the upcoming Power Rangers movie reboot, is being eyed to pen the script for Legendary's potential live-action Pokemon effort. In addition to Chronicle and Power Rangers, Landis also penned last year's American Ultra, which I actually didn't see, and Victor Frankenstein, which was awful and is currently working on the Will Smith-fronted fantasy thriller Bright for Netflix. For those unaware, Max is the son of legendary Hollywood director John Landis, the man behind such classics as Animal House, The Blues Brothers, and American Werewolf in London. Real great movies, especially Animal House. Max actually got his first screenwriting credit on a Masters of Horror episode directed by John Landis. Max Landis aside, my feelings on a live-action Pokemon movie are just kind of... No, I kind of don't want to see that. I mean, I feel like it was unavoidable anyway because Pokemon, like, right now it's more popular than it has ever been. But Pokemon has always been super popular. Every time there's a new game that comes out in the main Pokemon series, it sells like crazy. 
But for me personally, the last time like I really, really got into Pokemon was Generation 4. I mean, I played Generation 5 and 6, but for me, I feel like I stopped like really getting into Pokemon after Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart, Gold, and Soul, Silver. Like to me, the Pokemon generations that I feel like are the key ones are 1, 2, 3, and 4 because in Generation 4, you basically made God, Arceus, and really there's not much you could do to top that. So, I mean, that's just me. And the reason I'm not too fond on this is because, one, it's a, both a video game and an anime. Uh, video game movies don't particularly turn out to be very good. Uh, and even if it wasn't a video game, you still have the anime Pokemon. Uh, and whenever Hollywood seems to make a movie based on Japanese anime, it never goes out very well. It's given to people who really don't know what they're doing. And plus, they make it for cheap. Uh, but, I mean, with Legendary going after it, they might be willing to put out the money for it. So... I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, another thing is just, like, from the perspective of someone who grew up with Pokemon, it's hard to imagine how you make live-action versions of something like Charizard, Pikachu, uh, uh, Squirtle, Onyx, Mewtwo, uh, all these Pokemon. How do you turn them into live-action? So, I mean, we'll see what happens. Uh, I mean, if it comes out, I'll go see it just out of curiosity's sake because, again, I'm a 90s kid and I grew up with Pokemon. So, we'll see what happens. But let's move on from little animals that you catch in balls to the Amazonian goddess herself, Wonder Woman. So, Comic-Con is just around the corner and I feel like we're going to get some more info on stuff like Marvel, Star Wars, and DC at Hall H. But we have a bit of news concerning Wonder Woman, the upcoming Wonder Woman movie that's coming out next year starring Gal Gadot and Chris Pine. This article comes from comicbookresources.com. And basically what we have here is the official film description and the fact that Jeff Johns, who is now the creative consultant for the DC Extended Universe, co-wrote the Wonder Woman script. Here's what it says. Wonder Woman hits movie theaters around the world next summer when Gal Gadot returns as the title character in the epic adventure from director Patty Jenkins. Before she was Wonder Woman, she was Diana, princess of the Amazons, trained to be an unconquerable warrior. Raised on a sheltered island paradise, where an American pilot crashes on their shores and tells of a massive conflict raging in the outside world, Diana leaves home, convinced she can stop the threat, fighting alongside man in a war to end all wars. Diana will discover her full powers and her true destiny. But the big interesting thing here is that the credit for screenwriting was given to Alan Hainberg and Jeff Johns with a story by Zack Snyder and Alan Hainberg. And this is really interesting because I think for a while I read that the movie was being written by Jason Fuchs or Fox? No, Fuchs. Uh, who wrote the critically panned Pan last year, which was really an awful movie. And currently, if you look on my YouTube channel, it's, at the moment, the last movie I gave the Burn in Hell movie rating to. Uh, so, when I heard that he was writing Wonder Woman, I was like, uh-oh. But if that's not the case, and it's being written by these two guys, then maybe we have some hope. Maybe there is some hope that this will be better. I will see what happens. I mean, I could talk more about DC a little later in the show, so let's just go on to our final story concerning Star Trek. Now, we all know that Star Trek Beyond, the third uh, Star Trek film, is coming out this weekend. I'm really looking forward to it. I've actually heard somewhat good word of mouth, even though the official embargo uh, doesn't get lifted until Wednesday, which most of the time when a movie has an embargo for critics the day, like a couple days before it comes out, that's usually not a good sign. Uh, may, maybe a week, sure, there's a little more faith there, but a couple days, I don't know. But anyway, that's beside the point. This story comes from ScreenRant.com, and it says that Star Trek IV, Chris Hemsworth to return. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, 
Wait a minute, Chris Hemsworth was in Star Trek? Yeah, before he was Thor, he was actually the father of James Kirk, who sacrificed his life at the beginning of J.J. Abrams' first movie. This story actually comes from Scott Manns of Access Hollywood. He talked to J.J. Abrams and basically got word that fourth Star Trek movie is happening, and it might involve time travel with Chris Pine and Chris Hemsworth meeting together. So basically, Kirk, in this alternate timeline will be able to finally meet his father which sounds kind of cool but i'm a little skeptic of it because one thing that people kind of criticize star trek into darkness for doing is being kind of a remake of wrath of khan because it was the second movie wrath of khan was the second movie in the original series so you kind of remade the second movie as your second movie this movie it's with star trek 4 with the details that we currently have now it sounds like it's going to involve time travel, which Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, involved time travel. So, I don't know about this at all. I mean, it sounds interesting. I'll have to see how I feel about a Star Trek IV, uh, depending on my views on Star Trek Beyond. Which, again, I'm really looking forward to. I'm hoping for the best. Uh, so, we'll see what happens. So, that pretty much does it for the news. Let's move on to the Blu-ray releases of this week, which... Oh, it's finally here. Huh? I mean, people have seen it already because of digital release, huh? but we finally have Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice on Blu-ray, which I actually refuse to call it Batman v. Superman. I'm taking a note from James Rolfe where Batman v. Superman just sounds so stupid. Huh? But anyway, Batman vs. Superman has been finally released on Blu-ray, which... Is currently my least favorite movie of the year. Um, and I didn't want it to be my least favorite movie of the year. I went into this hoping for it to be great. If you saw my review, I went into this wanting it to be awesome. I wanted it to be grand. I wanted it to be a really good superhero movie. Yeah? But no, it ended up being really one of the worst <laughs> uh, superhero movies. The more I think about it, and I think the reason why it's kind of up there with one of the worst is because... It had so much money into it. It had so much time to be made. It had so much potential behind it uh, that there's no excuse for it to be as bad as it is. Uh, and to top it all off, you had good elements in there. You had Ben Affleck as Batman. Uh, um, he was the best looking Batman out there, even though he murders a bunch of people. Uh, Gal Gadot is good as Wonder Woman for the little time that she's in the movie. Uh, you look at her and go, you know what? She makes a good Wonder Woman. But then there's just a bunch of other stuff that's just so bad, so poorly done. And it's basically they just try to cram way too much in this movie. Uh, they're desperate to try and catch up with Marvel. And really, it's just like, take your time. Take your time setting these things up. If you make people wait... The rewards will be better. I don't know. But this, uh, what's interesting about this release is that for a while there's been talk about the R rated cut of Batman vs. Superman, or the Ultimate Edition as it's referred to. Uh, basically, um, people have seen it already, and people have said it makes it a better movie, but not by a whole lot. Uh, and kind of confirms the uh, cinematographer's original quote that fans who love the theatrical version are going to love the ultimate edition and those who did not are still not going to like it huh? but i've heard a lot of things back and forth the one time i've actually heard somebody say that the ultimate edition is worse than the theatrical edition huh, is cory coleman from doubletoasted.com huh? but i'm really curious to see this myself and i will be reviewing it so either this week or next week, uh, look out for my review for Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, The Ultimate Edition. Because I feel like with the road cut of X-Men Days of Future Past, uh, there's been a lot of buzz around it that I felt like I wanted to see it anyway. And there's been a lot of buzz around this too. I'm willing to give this a second chance. Uh, I'm not thrilled that it's three hours long, but I want to give this another chance so bad. Uh, I don't come into these DC movies wanting to hate them. I want I go in wanting to love them, and I'm always disappointed when they turn out to be bad. So, I'm holding out hope that maybe it could make me go, okay, that was a little better. I mean, I want to like this series. I really do. So, I mean, 
I- I'm going to move on because I'm just getting more irritated. So I'm, I'll see it. I'll review it. I'm hoping for the best. So let's move on. Um, outside of Batman vs Superman, there's not a whole lot to mention. Um, well, we have the complete series of Person of Interest on Blu-ray. From the Criterion Collection, we have... Where is it? Ah, A Touch of Zen from 1971. And, you know, since it's the 50% off sale now at Barnes & Noble for Criterion releases, you might as well go over there and get it. And also we have Night and Fog. And we also have Muriel or The Time of Return on Blu-ray from the Criterion Collection. And then if you're curious, if you're one of those people who's adapted the um, new... 4K Ultra HD discs. We have obviously we have Batman vs Superman coming out on that format. We also have uh, Watchmen, the Ultimate Cut, and Man of Steel, which basically it's just a Zack Snyder fest for 4K Ultra HD this week. And then we also have the Return of the Living Dead from Scream Factory. And that pretty much does it. That's pretty much all the Blu-ray releases of this week. Next week, I'm looking ahead. I can't say there's a whole lot that's super interesting. There's some things that are worth mentioning, but we'll get to them when we get to them. So that does it for the show. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below and tell me what you think of all these news stories. Uh, Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share me with your friends. Check out my official website, therealmrrobinson.com. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, Rift.tv. And if you love what I'm doing on this channel, whether it's movie reviews, Let's Plays, or podcasts, you can go over to Patreon.com slash TheRealMrRobinson and give out a monthly donation. And tune in this week, or this Wednesday more specifically, where I will unveil my new series of retro reviews. So I won't say what it is, but if you saw the end of my Ghostbusters 2 review, there's a hint on what it is. So definitely check that out. And until next time, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.